Uh, Crane is a challenge. <laughs> uh, he's, he's a challenge for you. Uh, he's a, a, a challenge for me as a teacher. Uh, he's a challenging poet. He challenges his reader. He uh, challenges us and he, uh, uh, he makes invitations to us. Uh, he, um, um, well, he, he, um, he calls to us in various ways, places demands on us. Uh, I'd like to um, talk about uh, a text I'm not, in fact, holding. Uh, I wonder if, uh, does somebody have an RIS packet handy and I could have it in my hands? Thank you, Gene. Um, and that is uh, the poem Legend which is um, the uh, poem uh, placed first in um, Crane's first and only book of lyrics called White Buildings. Uh, it's, a, it's a poem that he used to introduce himself to the reader, as it were. So why don't we uh, use it to um, uh, begin thinking about his work? Uh, as silent as a mirror is believed, reality is plunged in silence by. The poem begins uh, with that, with a kind of um, riddle or enigma, and then the first person comes forward. I am not ready for repentance, nor to match regrets. For the moth bends no more than the still imploring flame. <laughs> it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful idea. Uh, I'm not going to repent of anything. I'm not going to regret anything. Uh, I have not uh, bent any more. I have nothing more to regret than the, the flame which has drawn me. Uh, which uh, uh, bent as well. For the moth bends no more than the still imploring flame, and tremorous in the white falling flakes kisses are, comma, dash, the only worth all granting. And characteristically here for Crane, there's a, uh, well, a compressed set of images. Um, uh, those tremorous uh, white falling flakes there, well, they're almost images, aren't they, of uh, a burnt moth, a moth that's been drawn to uh, the flame. Uh, and then uh, those come to be seen as here uh, kisses. <coughs> um, kisses, if we unpack Crane's odd syntax, uh, it would seem, the sentence would seem to read, although it's maybe available to other constructions, uh, kisses are tremorous in the white falling flakes. Uh, but these kisses, <coughs> these kisses that are um, uh, also emblems of, uh, 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 of flame and, and of uh, extinction even, uh, are the only worth all granting. That is, the only value that seems to grant all, I think. Again, those, those, fra those, those words, all granting, um, uh, might be construed in a, a couple of different ways. Crane says, uh, it is to be learned. What is to be learned? This cleaving and this burning, the kind I'm talking about. Uh, uh, we, we must learn to be drawn to the flame, and we must learn to recover from the, uh, uh, recover from the flame uh, and uh, uh, renew our uh, desires and renew our quests. Uh, it is to be learned, this cleaving and this burning, but only by the one who spends out himself again. In order to do this, you've got to spend yourself repeatedly over and over again. Uh, and then he, he gives us 
other images of this kind of repeated burning, twice and twice, again, the smoking souvenir, bleeding eidolon, and eidolon is the Greek word for an image. Uh, and yet again, this activity is repeated and repeated until the bright logic is won. Unwhispering, he returns to that initial enigmatic image, unwhispering as a mirror is believed. Then drop, by caustic drop, a perfect cry shall string some constant harmony, relentless caper for all those, and here we are challenged and invited to meet him and join him, who step the legend of their youth into the noon. Well, it's a hard poem, uh, and yet uh, there are a few, I think, simple basic ideas that it projects that are important to the poet that Crane saw himself as uh, and um, uh, the one he wants uh, uh, us to receive and, in a sense, join. Uh, he presents himself as an unrepentant visionary, uh, romantic, uh, and lover, since, after all, uh, these roles are all uh, held in some association here. Um, <coughs> he talks about uh, here a willingness that's erotic, that's aesthetic, uh, sp that's spiritual, to uh, exhaust oneself in the pursuit of one's desires, to spend out yourselves again and repeatedly. Uh, there is in this uh, the promise that by doing it repeatedly, drop by caustic drop, uh, a kind of lyric voice will emerge that will be a perfect cry. And despite this destruction and pain and blood, bleeding Eidolon, a constant that is sustained harmony will be achieved. Uh, harmony invoking, of course, more than one voice. Uh, and what is this? This is uh, a, a poetic project, uh, and it's a, it's a project that he describes as a relentless caper. <laughs> a relentless caper. Uh, a caper, a caper uh, it comes from Latin, uh, the sense of uh, the, uh, the goat that leaps. Uh, it's also, it's a word that, that suggests, um, uh, well, some kind of uh, uh, minor mischief. Uh, a relentless caper for all those who step the legend of their youth into the noon. Uh, and here Crane presents himself as a young person who would project uh, all of uh, the youthful vitality of his vision and desire into this uh, symbolically pregnant moment that he calls the noon. <coughs> it's, a, it's a time very important in Crane's imagination. Uh, I think idiosyncratically, uh, individually, but also uh, in a way that, that alludes to uh, Noon in, in Emily Dickinson's poems. Uh, Dickinson being a poet that uh, Crane shares a great deal with. Uh, the poetry uh, of Hart Crane, uh, well, it proposes to approach what he calls Noon, which is uh, an experience of uh, fullness and uh, uh, absolute uh, presence. Now, uh, what does he mean uh, he's not ready for repentance? Uh, who, who, after all, has told him to repent? Who has, uh, who has told him he has something to regret? Uh, repent <laughs> is something that Crane heard from the culture at large. Uh, in important ways. Uh, Crane is writing in the mid-20s. Uh, we're at this point, uh, I think this is a poem from 1924 or so. Um, uh, it is um, post-war America. 
uh, Crane sees himself uh, as a member of a new youthful world uh, centered in uh, places like Greenwich Village. Uh, he sees himself as part of a young America, uh, uh, bound together uh, across place uh, by a kind of common dedication to art uh, and to their um, will to free themselves from the sexual and economic disciplines that he calls in this uh, letter that I have. <coughs> Um, quoted uh, other uh, sentences from, uh, calls Puritanism. Uh, Crane, Crane is uh, writing in an era, the era of the 18th Amendment. Uh, prohibition is in effect. Um, there is um, a range of, of kinds of censorship that are, you know, a real and present threat. James Joyce's novel Ulysses has been banned from the United States shores for its obscenity. Uh, there's a way in which modernist art uh, is mixed up with questions of sexuality. Crane got his copy of Ulysses uh, smuggled from France. <coughs> which a friend then stole. <laughs> uh, Crane, uh, Crane is living, uh, too, uh, in, in a um, uh, vital and nascent uh, gay culture in New York, in particular, uh, uh, and yet within uh, a, a nation uh, then as now uh, that is um, strongly homophobic and anti gay <coughs> in all sorts of ways. Um, Crane's insistence on um, his refusal to repent, uh, his refusal to regret uh, are um, uh, um, assertions of um, um, his will towards forms of sexual and imaginative freedom. Uh, they're also um, affirmations of a romantic poetics uh, essential to him. Um, the um, there's also a literary historical context for this that's uh, important, and that I think you can probably already uh, start to uh, 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 guess at. <coughs> Uh, Crane is a deep and a deeply ambivalent reader of The Wasteland and T.S. Eliot. Uh, he says in this uh, uh, letter to, to Gorham Munson uh, in January 1923, there's no one writing in English who can command so much respect to my mind as Eliot. However, I take Eliot as a point of departure towards an almost complete reverse of direction. His pessimism is amply justified in his own case. Why? I don't know. <laughs> what Crane, Crane had is his fantasies about Eliot's sexual life, uh, I, I think. <coughs> um, but I would apply as much of his erudition and technique as I can absorb and assemble toward a more positive, or if I must put it so, in a skeptical age, ecstatic goal. I should not think of this if a kind of rhythm and ecstasies were not, at odd moments and rare, a very real thing to me. I feel that Eliot ignores certain spiritual events and possibilities as real and powerful now as, say, in the time of Blake. Blake is very important to Crane. Certainly the man has dug the ground and buried hope as deep and direfully as it can ever be done. After this perfection of death, which is what Crane is, is uh, uh, this is how he's reading The Wasteland. Nothing is possible in motion but a resurrection of some kind. 
he says. Well, um, <coughs> Crane is um, reading The Wasteland, and he's reading Eliot's criticism. Uh, he's responding to, well, he's responding to a series of, of texts, and I'll, I'll just show you some of what he's reading here. Um, this is uh, the criterion, the first place uh, Eliot's poetry, uh, The Wasteland, appeared. Uh, that's in October 1922, Eliot's own magazine. Um, the um, first American publication of the poem was in The Dial. Uh, in uh, November 1922, and um, then uh, the poem appeared in, um, I don't know if you can see that very well, um, the poem appeared in uh, New York publication in book form uh, in, uh, as its own discrete uh, text, when um, uh, the uh, Livewright edition of the poem was, was uh, being prepared, uh, as I mentioned last time, uh, Eliot was asked to make the poem a little longer, because after all, it was a little too short, <coughs> uh, and, uh, or so the story goes. Uh, and this was, in part, uh, one of his motives for producing the notes to the poem. Uh, as I said last time, and this is the uh, uh, way the poet poem looked in uh, America uh, when it, it first uh, appeared, uh, with, and of course with just a few lines per page. Uh, I, last time I called it the long, long, shortest long poem in the language. Uh, you, you can see the uh, way in which it's sort of drawn out. <coughs> um, here's the uh, little section I. Uh, uh, ended by talking about death by water. Well, um, as I suggested last time, Eliot's notes uh, and um, uh, suggested, created um, a kind of um, role for the poet, where the poet was not only the creative lyric uh, um, presence at the center of the poem, but was also a kind of uh, scholar uh, and critic uh, of his own work, uh, framing uh, it, uh, mastering bodies of knowledge and uh, arranging uh, meaning uh, in ways that the notes uh, emblematize. Um, in the process, Eliot's doing a, a couple of things. He, uh, that, that Crane is responding to. Um, he is establishing himself uh, in what I described as a new role, uh, and that's very much the role you see uh, Eliot uh, uh, embodying here. That is, the, the poet as a, uh, as a kind of uh, uh, scholar poet, um, uh, a uh, um, figure backed by uh, institutional um, authority of various kinds. And uh, this figure is created specifically in the wasteland uh, through the, um, through the poems turning away from and turning against in complicated ways. Uh, its own forms of Romanticism, um, which last time I suggested uh, were uh, emblematized by that drowned Phoenician sailor, uh, Phlebas, um, who um, is a kind of figure for what the poem sacrifices, uh, or you might say a kind of version of the self that Eliot uh, is willing to give up. Um, Crane, encountering the poem, 
I think, must have been obsessed with the section Death by Water. Um, must have been, um, <clears throat> must have seen, must have, must have heard Eliot talking to him when uh, <coughs> Eliot says, uh, consider Phlebas, uh, the Phoenician sailor who was once tall and handsome as you. Um, Crane means to uh, reassert the power of youth, reassert uh, the potential for romantic vision, uh, and uh, to do so uh, in a way that would, um, that he imagines as a kind of resurrection and specifically as a, as a kind of passage through and beyond death by water. Uh, drowning uh, is an uh, important imaginative motif in uh, Crane's work. The poems that I'll, I'll concentrate on now to uh, explore this idea uh, all have um, images of romance, quest, and, and drowning uh, at their, their center. Uh, and I mean, uh, first of all, the uh, very great love poem called Voyages on 609, um, which uh, Eliot, excuse me, which Crane uh, began uh, in the spring of 1924, about a year uh, after he's read The Wasteland. Uh, and the poem is, I think, his first sort of developed reply. Uh, and it uh, centers, as I say, um, on uh, images of drowning. The uh, poem arises from uh, a love affair with, uh, as it happens, uh, a Danish sailor uh, who was part of the um, uh, Bohemian um, uh, crowd around the Provincetown, Provincetown players in, in Greenwich Village. Uh, Crane's letters are full of, um, well, both reflections on Eliot uh, and also uh, ecstatic um, and um, very moving um, accounts of his love affair with Emil Opfer. Uh, I'll I'll read you just a few sentences from one letter to um, uh, his friend Waldo Frank. He says, Crane does, uh, it will take many letters to let you know what I mean for myself at least when I say in this relationship that I have seen the word made flesh. I mean nothing less. And I know now that there is such a thing as indestructibility. In the deepest sense, where flesh became transformed through intensity of response to counter-response, where sex was beaten out, where a purity of joy was reached that included tears. Uh, imagery from, from this and, and other letters that Crane uh, wrote during the period uh, uh, um, emerge in, in Voyages. The very first section of Voyages uh, had been, in fact, sitting on Crane's desk for uh, three years. <clears throat> Above the fresh ruffles of the surf, bright striped urchins flay each other with sand. They have contrived a quest, <clears throat> excuse me, a conquest for shell shucks, and their fingers crumble fragments of baked weed, gaily digging and scattering. And in answer to their treble reflections, the sun beats lightning on the waves, the waves fold thunder in the sand. And could they hear me, I would say, I would tell them, oh, brilliant kids, frisk with your dog, fondle your shells and sticks, bleached by time and the elements. But there is a line you must not cross nor ever trust beyond it, spry cordage of your bodies to caresses too like and faithful from too wide a breast. The bottom of the sea is cruel. 
the poem begins on shore, begins with uh, kids playing. Uh, their play, in all its innocence, seems to imply and gesture towards um, ferocious energies that um, uh, are emblematized by the sea uh, in all of its thunder and lightning and power. Uh, you, you, they fondle, they flay. Uh, the, the shoreline is a, is a place where there, there are fragments of um, debris, uh, uh, proof of the sea's force. Uh, the poem begins with a simple moral uh, injunction or, or practical, really, uh, 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 practical warning. To give yourself over to the sea would be to enter a field of unbounded energy, to risk your identity, to risk being overwhelmed. Think of proof rock on the shore. Shall I wear my trousers rolled? Uh, Crane is uh, there in the same, same place. Uh, and having issued this warning, acknowledged the cruelty of the bottom of the sea, he throws it off and throws it behind and enters the water. And yet, that important piece of Cranian punctuation, the dash, uh, a, a bit of punctuation that separates and connects elements, uh, pushes that warning away and takes us uh, into the sea. And yet this great wink of eternity, of rimless floods, a kind of borderless space, unfettered leewardings, Samite sheeted in procession to where her undinal vast belly, Crane images the sea here uh, as, a as a woman's body and as a kind of belly that bends towards the moon. Uh, you know, it's a, a kind of vision of, of the uh, kind of open horizon of the sea, as you, you know, it seems to kind of project the curve of the earth in it. Uh, her undinal vast belly moonward bends, laughing the rapt inflections of our love. There's, uh, that's a, a kind of uh, wonderful cranian word, um, <coughs> rapt. Uh, it it's, uh, would seem to mean both uh, rapt in the sense of wrapped up uh, and rapt in the sense of held in rapture. Uh, he's kind of combined possibly through error, these two forms. Crane makes errors. He's unlike the scholarly Eliot. <coughs> Uh, he continues uh, and, and now gives us instructions. Take this sea, whose diapason nails on scrolls of silver snowy sentences, the sceptered terror of whose session rends, as her demo demeanor's motion, well or ill, all but the pieties of lovers' hands. Uh, here, uh, being in the space of the sea um, is like being in love or um, in the act of love, as Crane imagines it. It's also like being in a fabulous rhetorical world, uh, a, a space of gorgeous, extravagant uh, language, uh, which Crane unleashes here in all of its uh, um, um, terrific force. Uh, it's, it's language that, that um, is iambic pentameter, <laughs> unlike Eliot, uh, is uh, a language uh, uh, as rich and, and ornate uh, as um, on the uh, English Renaissance stage. Marlowe would have liked this. Um, it is uh, also a kind of uh, romantic um, uh, diction and uh, their are um, elements of sort of late 19th century British and French poetry that Crane is combining here. He says, and onward as bells off San Salvador salute the crocus luster of the stars. 
In these poinsettia meadows of her tides, adagios of islands, oh my prodigal, complete the dark confessions her veins spell. Mark how her turning shoulders wind the hours and hasten while her penniless rich palms pass superscription of bent foam and wave. Hasten while they are true because they will not be true forever. Sleep, death, desire. Close round one instant in one floating flower. Crane understands that love, like rhetoric, cast a spell and uh, that love and poetry create illusions. Uh, he does not, therefore, despise them. Uh, this is different from uh, uh, Eliot uh, in, in a, in a uh, uh, basic way. He acknowledges, as it were, the temporariness of uh, his um, uh, desire. In fact, he says, bind us in time, O seasons clear and awe, O minstrel galleons of carob fire. What are minstrel galleons of carob fire? Well, maybe they're actual ships that he's imagining passing among. Maybe uh, they are um, um, uh, the lights of the moon or sun on the sea. He says to the sea, bequeath us, I know we're going to die, bequeath us to no earthly shore. In other words, don't bury us. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Until, and as in legend, Crane produces a, a funny syntactic reversal here. Bequeath us to no earthly shore until is answered in the vortex of our grave the seal's wide spindrift gaze toward paradise. Uh, there, uh, the subject of the sentence comes last. Uh, the sentence is, the seal's wide spindrift gaze is answered in the vortex of our grave. What Crane has done there is, um, well, he's reversed the syntactic order of subject and verb. By doing so, he's introduced first the image of death by drowning. Uh, that is the vortex of our grave. Uh, and uh, he's put that up first, and then he's followed it with the image of the seal's gaze, which uh, comes uh, and emerges um, after drowning. Uh, that the seal is here a kind of figure of a kind of consciousness uh, and desire expressed through the eyes uh, that, is, uh, that survives death. Uh, look back to the poem preceding um, called At Melville's Tomb. Uh, there is uh, uh, here, this is a kind of elegy for Melville, which uh, seems to presume falsely uh, that Melville uh, is uh, uh, drowned and not buried on shore as he is. Uh, and there, there's an image, of, again, of drowning uh, in um, lines 11 and, and 12. Uh, and again, a kind of image of a, a vortex. Uh, then in the circuit come of one vast coil after the storm that has wrecked the ship, its lashings charmed, and those lashings remind you of the flayings of the kids on the, in voyages, its lashings charmed and malice reconciled. Frosted eyes there were that lifted altars, and silent answers crept across the stars. Uh, how do eyes lift altars? In um, uh, Crane's letter to Harriet Monroe in defense of this poem uh, and what he calls the logic of metaphor, Crane uh, says, well, um, eyes lift altars in the sense that they bring the object of their desire into being uh, through their desire. That is, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you raise the altar, you create the, the, the uh, object of worship through your yearning for 
uh, it. Um, this is, uh, you know, again, a, a, a kind of visionary act, uh, and it's uh, a version of the one that we find at the end of uh, the second section of uh, voyages, where we see the the seagulls, excuse me, the um, um, uh, the seals' wide spindrift gaze toward paradise. Uh, wide, uh, wide, because it's a gaze that 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 is large uh, and takes in um, um, uh, much uh, space. Uh, wide, because the sea is a is a kind of space in which we have latitude of action. Spindrift. It's a word that Crane took from. Moby Dick uh, from Melville, uh, replacing another word, not such a good word, which also came from Moby Dick, Finrini. Uh, it's a good he got rid of that. <coughs> uh, uh, spindrift is important. When you are in the sea, it is like being in the crane poem. You don't have the ground under your feet. You spin and you drift. Uh, you spin and you drift, and words mix and match and create words like spindrift. Uh, this is a condition that Crane calls in the next poem infinite consanguinity, where there's a kind of sharing of, of elements, uh, a kind of uh, uh, transformation um, through uh, exchange that goes on. This is understood as what happens uh, in love. Uh, it's also uh, understood as a kind of model for poetic process. Uh, it's imaged here in this poem in, a, in triumphant language uh, as a kind of um, uh, transcendence of death. Uh, here describing uh, uh, a, a moment of climactic intensity, Crane writes, and so admitted through black swollen gates that must arrest all distance otherwise past whirling pillars and lithe pediments, light wrestling there incessantly with light, star kissing star through wave on wave unto your body rocking. And where death, if shed like a skin, presumes no carnage, no uh, final death of the body, but rather this single change Upon the steep floor flung from dawn to dawn, the silken skilled transmemberment of song. Permit me voyage, love, into your hands. Uh, the silken skilled transmemberment of song. This is Crane's uh, final fantastic line of iambic pentameter, <laughs> where uh, he proclaims a kind of uh, uh, transformation that is uh, at once uh, erotic and rhetorical, uh, where um, uh, elements uh, uh, between two parties have been exchanged, just as exchanged and reversed, just as the uh, silk and skill. Uh, give us phonemes that are held in almost kind of mirror relationship uh, and alliteration, the ILK, KIL. Uh, and then Crane introduces us to another word uh, that he coins, uh, transmemberment. Uh, transmemberment, what does transmemberment mean? It seems to be made out of what? Uh, remember, uh, dismember, uh, transformation. He's talking about a kind of activity that involves uh, all of these things at once uh, and um, uh, through it uh, achieves a kind of um, vision of uh, union, which is, uh, again, as I say, uh, both uh, linguistic and uh, um, interpersonal. Well, um, that seems like a good uh, place to stop for now. Uh, we'll um, carry these poems on as a, as a way to uh, read his long poem in reply to the wasteland, the bridge. <laughs>